Days, uh, Dharma Young Investigator Award, ONR Young Investigator Award, and so on and so forth, and is also fellow of American Physical Society and Hospital Center. So, Kiana, welcome back. Thank you, Marco. Thank you for the great introduction, and uh, I'm glad you didn't show any embarrassing photos from grad school here. <laughs> <laughs> Next time, <laughs> I'll do that when you do this paper. Next time, I'll get some from high school. Yeah, thank you all for coming here, uh, and um, yeah, I'd like to share some of the, the recent work from my, my group at Sanford, and uh, um, even some preliminary results that we have from the collaboration that we started uh, with, with Martin's group. Um, so uh, I'm looking forward to, to showing them to you uh, and uh, getting some, some insight and new ideas on that. Um, so as probably many of you know, uh, I uh, lead quantum uh, nanophotonics group at Stanford. Uh, we're interested in studies of fundamental effects, uh, including heavy QED, quantum optics, nonlinear optics. Uh, but we're also interested in practical applications of these effects, including building structures for optical interconnects, optical communications, uh, quantum networks, uh, biophotonics. And uh, very recently, we got involved in um, laser-driven non-ship accelerator collaboration led by Bob Dyer at Stanford, where the idea is to use nanophotonic structures to localize lasers and use them to accelerate electrons. So nanophotonics are actually going on in that direction. So in the interest of time, today I will mostly uh, cover our fundamental uh, physics work and also talk about some of our recent work uh, uh, on these very strange looking structures that also have some fundamental applications. So let me start by our uh, light matter interaction work. So our traditional platform for light matter interaction for many years uh, consisted of gallium arsenic photonic crystal cavities, shown here. Uh, probably many, or most of you now know how gallium arsenic photonic crystals look like. So you build these periodic arrays of holes, build them in a membrane. Uh, they have dimensions of few microns and they localize field very strongly with quality factors, uh, which for our experiments, for the wavelength range of our interest and for this material system, typically range between 10 and 25,000. And they can be much higher than silicon, for instance, and at longer wavelengths, but this is not where we work. We work with uh, uh, gallium arsenic at around 900 nanometers for the reasons that will become obvious in a moment. So Q factor is very uh, good, um, but mode volume, which is maybe even more interesting, is very small. It's 0.7 cubic optical wavelengths for this particular type of cavity, uh, which means that you can localize field very strongly uh, inside of the central region and then make it interact strongly with matter that is located there. Uh, the other ingredient of our light matter interaction platform uh, is a quantum emitter. Uh, as I said, traditionally we've been using mini arsenide quantum dots in gallium arsenide. Uh, they're grown by uh, molecular beam epitaxy, self-assembly molecular beam epitaxy. Uh, and they're randomly positioned, as you see from the AFM image. They have about 20 nanometers linear, nanometers vertically, they're 2 nanometers uh, tall. Uh, they're in the arsenide, surrounded by gallium arsenide. So basically for carriers, electrons, and holes that are inside of this chunk of indium arsenide, um, this looks like a potential box, quantum box. Carriers cannot escape uh, outside. Uh, they have to occupy discrete energy levels. There is also a correction coming from cool interaction. And uh, uh, we have discrete spectra for transitions corresponding to recombination of electron hole uh, pairs or, or combinations, complexes. Uh, so here is how a uh, quantum dot spectrum looks like for uh, one of the typical quantum dots. It has very narrow line uh, wavelength range is around 900 nanometers. That's somewhat tunable. It's between 900 and 940 nanometers. And here we look at the spectrum of a neutral expansion, which corresponds to recombination of one electron hole. So that's our quantum. Uh, what is important to notice here is that quantum dot limit is much narrower than the cavity resonance limit, and that's the case for all of the experiments that I'll show, uh, which means that quantum dots basically um, behave as good emitters, or we operate in the bad cavity limit. Right? So kappa is much bigger than gamma. And later in the talk, I'll mention some of our uh, more recent work on color centers, and actually Surgeon's talk, student talk at the beginning, uh, was a great introduction to that. And in fact, we're also collaborating with Marco uh, on, on this uh, aspect of the work. So alternative to quantum dots are various color centers in solids, including silicon vacancy centers. So how do we build the light matter interaction platform? For quantum dots, we start from uh, gallium arsenide. Uh, which has quantum dots that are already grown inside, embedded inside during the growth process. 
Uh, we grow them at Stanford, but many groups around the world also can grow them. And then we carve out uh, these photonic crystal cavities in the material by using electron beam lithography, dry etching, bed etching processes. Um, and we end up with the membranes that have quantum dots uh, somewhere inside of the central region when they can couple uh, to the field. Um, and we start with some optimal density. We make many cavities and we can end up with about 10 to 15% of all of the fabricated systems that can operate in the original meters. Uh, we're primarily interested in the so-called uh, strong coupling regime of interaction and all the experiments that I'll show you with quantum dots are uh, corresponding to the strong coupling regime. Uh, where the coupling strength between the quantum dot and the cavity field, G parameter, uh, exceeds all the loss rates of the system. It's greater than the cavity field decay rate and it's greater than the dipole decay rate. Well, technically it's greater than kappa half and gamma half. Um, and uh, the way to get into this regime clearly is by reducing mode volume, because G scales is 1 over square root of the mode volume, and kappa scales is 1 over Q factor. And if you remember the slide that I showed you previously, gamma is much smaller than kappa, so basically doesn't determine the threshold for entering the strong coupling regime in our case. As you'll see in a moment, all of the rates for our system are in the gigahertz range. Um, and of course, people have, are, have been doing experiments in cavity QED and atomic physics for many years, but everything that we do here is much faster because everything is in the order of gigahertz or tens of gigahertz. Okay, so what happens when you have a strongly coupled system where G exceeds kappa and, and gamma? Um, well, in that case, you expect to observe Rabi splitting and crossing. So if you scan your emitter, your quantum dot across the cavity resonance, and you can do that here by applying strain, electrical tuning, or the simplest method would be temperature tuning, as you see here, uh, you would be scanning the resonance of quantum dot, and temperature would tune quantum dot resonance three times faster than the cavity resonance. So if your system is weakly coupled, quantum dot resonance will just cross the cavity resonance. If the system is strongly coupled, then they anti-cross and they exhibit this uh, Rabi splitting, as shown here. And these states here are basically in the crossing regime, not anymore quantum dot states or cavity states. They are entangled or hybridized states of light and matter. Uh, and we also refer to them as polarisms. So the splitting between the two branches is 2G, G being the same coupling parameter between the quantum dot and the cavity field that I noted before. And the line width of these branches depends on the losses of the system, depends on kappa and gamma. So in this crossing regime, it depends on the combination of kappa and gamma, and far from that, it depends either on kappa for cavity branch or gamma for quantum dot branch. Um, from experimental results, we can extract G and kappa and gamma, and for our system, G is typically between 10 and 25 gigahertz, kappa is between 8 and 18 gigahertz, and gamma is on your of 1 gigahertz although it can also get smaller than that because there is some suppression of spontaneous emission into other modes when you embed quantum dot uh, inside of the photonic crystal, so you can actually uh, slow down this loss into other um, loss mechanisms. Of course, there are many groups working on cavity QED. Uh, as I said, atomic cavity QED, including a lot of work here uh, by, by Misha and Vladan. Uh, and of course, there is a lot of quantum dot cavity QED work all around the world, um, and uh, circuit QED work um, led by groups at Yale. Um, I'll also mention some of the color centers work a little bit later, where people are also trying to get into the same cavity QED regime, and of course, um, most of that effort is actually happening here at Harvard. Okay. So uh, what can you do once you have a strongly coupled system that exhibits this anti crossing? Well, there are very many interesting experiments that you can do. Um, one uh, set of experiments that we recently did was probing of the light matter interaction. Um, what we do here is we measure dynamics of these polariton branches. I'll mention that a little bit later, where we resonantly drive them and just see how fast they decay. Uh, and that depends on, on uh, different mechanisms and photon assisted interaction with the system. Uh, we're also uh, able to uh, dress these dressed states that I'll, I'll talk about later. Um, we also can use the same platform for generation of non-classical states of light. Um, the, that's what we refer to as the coherent generation of quantum light. Um, and also we've done a lot of work on, on building some proof of concept uh, electro-optical modulators or optical switches using this strongly coupled system 
where in principle you can control the transmission to the system using uh, even um, uh, power or energy corresponding to a state of one photon. Right? So we demonstrated some, some end gate for uh, individual photons, and we also demonstrated the electro optical modulator that is controlled by a single quantum dot. And I will not really describe these experiments. Uh, they're interested uh, at the proof of concept level, of course, they all operate at cryogenic temperatures for quantum dots, but they give you an idea that you can push tra uh, traditional uh, state-of-the-art modulators or switches further um, into lower power, higher speed regime by using quantum effects. And of course, there has been a lot of, uh, of switching work done here uh, by Misha and Vladan using reverb atoms and also uh, atomic heavy QD with the same, same idea. Okay. So, um, in the interest of time, I will actually focus primarily on our experiments with on coherent generation of quantum light using quantum dots um, and using effects of photon blockade and photon tunneling. So, in order to explain what's going on there, uh, I have to tell you what is happening in this system beyond the simplest Rabi splitting that I already mentioned. Right. So, when you have quantum dot coupled to a cavity. Um, system is strongly coupled, you have anti-crossing between polaris and branches, right? So they don't cross if you tune them across each other. And of course, that's what we've demonstrated many times before, and I already showed you uh, some of the experiments. But the story doesn't end there. Um, in fact, the full uh, ladder of eigenstates, energy eigenstates of the system, is what we call dressed states ladder. And it has also higher order eigenstates that also exhibit anti-crossing. And you probably may have seen that in, in various physics classes. So for the second rung, the end crossing would be 2g root 2. And then for n rung, it would be 2g root n. And all of these eigenstates are, again, entangled or hybridized states of quantum dot excitations or quantum emitter excitation in the field excitation. So uh, why is this interesting? Well, the reason why this ladder is interesting is for us uh, and for the set of experiments that I'll explain is because it is enharmonic. That means that if you drive, for instance, one of the states in the first rung, uh, with that laser you will not be able to reach any of the states in the higher rungs for an ideal system because of the anharmonicity. And since you can place only one quantum of excitation into the first rung, um, that comes from the fact that these first uh, order eigenstates are formed by hybridizing one photon with a quantum dot state. Then all the other photons from your input laser, which has Poissonian statistics, will have no energy levels to couple to. So what happens here is what we call photon blockade, right? Let's say you shine a pulse laser, as in our experiments. Um, statistics of photons follows Poissonian distribution. Each laser pulse has a certain number of photons that uh, obeys Poissonian distribution around a certain mean photon number. What would happen if you pick the laser frequency corresponding to the frequency given by the blue arrow is that you would basically couple only one photon to the system at that frequency, and in transmission to the system, you would see one photon. Once that one photon is coupled, there are no eigenstates for the subsequent photons, and they would be blocked from entering the system. And that's what we call photon blockade. And then you can also extend the story and say, well, I can actually use two photon transition to drive the second rung, which comes from hybridization of two photons with a quantum dot state. And in that case, in this cartoon picture, which is not full and complete, as I'll explain later, but it's a good, good picture for a start, you would see what we call photon paneling, um, meaning that you would couple only two photons to the system, and then those two photons would be propagated to the output. But once those two photons are coupled, there would be no eigenstates for the third or other photon in the system uh, if in the input laser to couple to, which means that other additional photons would be blocked from entering. Of course, there would be many situations where you could not couple anything, because if you have only one photon per input laser pulse, it would just be blocked from entering. It doesn't have energy level to couple to. Uh, we first looked into these effects in 2008 in quantum dot cavity system. Uh, the first demonstration of photon blockade was done in 2005 uh, by my Kimball group, and then there were recent, more recent demonstrations by Rampe. Uh, and uh, then subsequently in quantum dot cavity systems, there were demonstrations by, by Atachi Momogu's group, and of course in circuit QED by, by Walraff and, and Shalkov uh, also very recently. So, so a lot of people have been studying photon blockade, 
we also looked into photon tunneling initially in 2008, and there are some related experiments on, on formation of photon molecules that, that Nish and Vladan have been doing in recent years. And I, and I think all the platform is different, the physics is, is uh, uh, or results are similar. Okay, so how do we characterize the system? So I'll first show you some of the results, not from 2008, but from 2012, so four years after our initial demonstration, right? So you take your, your pulse laser, you shine it into the system, you expect, ideally, to transmit photons one by one at that frequency corresponding to excitation of the first round, right? So if you just uh, take your Hamburg ground and twist type setup, which you can use to measure statistics of transmitted photons, uh, that's second order correlation function. Then, in, and if you have, ideally, single photon stream at the output, of course, you will not hear coincident clicks of these detectors because you cannot divide the photon here, so you have suppression of coincident clicks for sub postonian statistics. And by using the extension of these HBT setups, we can also measure statistics up to fourth order for these systems. So we're able to characterize also G3 and G4, right? So for an ideal system, you would see absence of coincident clicks, for a realistic system, you just see suppression of coincident clicks. And the ratio of that central peak to side peaks gives you this multi-photon probability suppression. So for us in this experiment, G2 of 0 was on the order of 0.85 to 0.9, right? It was not that impressive, right? I mean, it's just 15% uh, or 10 to 15% smaller than the side peaks. But clearly, there is something going on. Uh, we are changing statistics relative to Poissonian. It's not a laser anymore. And then in the photon tunneling regime, uh, where you drive this second run, you expect to preferentially filter two photons, but there is also a lot of vacuum. Actually, most of it is vacuum. Uh, you expect to see super Poissonian statistics. Um, and also in the experiments on photonic molecules uh, that, that uh, I mentioned done here by Nisha and Vladan, they also see super Poissonian statistics. And this comes from the fact that you have a lot of vacuum and then um, uh, present some higher order photon and non fox states such as two photon uh, oxide. So we see super Poissonian statistics. This central peak is higher than the side peaks, and, and that's also what we expect theoretically, right? But there is a clear contrast and we're changing statistics relative to Poissonian. So that's all fine, right? But if you scan your G2 of zero as a function of the laser detuning relative to an empty cavity, you see that you can transition from the regime of photon blockade, right, where you keep the first round, then you go to the regime of tunneling, where you start hitting higher order rungs, and you form this bell curve, right? And if you didn't have a strongly coupled system and you measure these statistics as a G2 of 0 as a function of the laser detuning from the cavity, you would just see G2 of 0 being flat at 1, right? That's the characteristics of the Poissonian statistics. So we're changing statistics relative to Poissonian, but not by much, right? More in the tunneling regime relative to blockade, but blockade is um, not so uh, impressive, right? So the question is, why is that the case? So the reason why this is the case is uh, because our system is realistic and is broadened by the losses, primarily by the cavity losses. Right? And I told you that ideal picture, we drive the first run, leather is unharmonic, we miss higher order runs, we cannot really couple seconds or, or other photons. But in reality, that's not the case. Right? You still have finite broadening, on all of these polaritons, it increases with higher order runs. Our cavity uh, broadening is very large. So even when you drive the first round, you have a finite probability of coupling to the second and higher order runs because of the broadening. Right? So instead of really filtering one photon, you are actually also uh, having finite probability of getting two photon states or three photon states at the output. Probabilities are different relative to Poissonian distribution, but and Overall distribution is sub-Poissonian, but it's not really single photon stream. So now the question is how can you improve this? An obvious solution would be, well, you can increase coupling strength G, or you can reduce losses and increase Q factor, reduce kappa. But that's all very challenging, and there is a limit to how far we can go in this particular material system. But we, uh, a few years ago, realized that if you use the tuned system, you can benefit from increased non-harmonicity that you have there. So if you detune system by few G, 2, 3, 4 G, and you still drive that, that first rung, so you're still operating in the regime where all these states are entangled states of quantum dot in the cavity field, right? So they're still not pure quantum dot or pure cavity states. It's not very large detuning. And you drive the first rung here, you will be missing the second rung by more, right? So unharmonicity is bigger because of the, the shape of the branches. 
And indeed, uh, if we perform the blockade experiment in the two regime for exactly the same system, we see G2 of 0 going down from around 0.85 or 0.9 to 0.29, right? Simply by detuning to about 5G in this case. And then we can also apply some, some filtering techniques, uh, both uh, um, some spatial fil filtering and spectral filtering, and reduce for the same detuning G2 to 0 to around 0.1. So this is becoming much more convincing, right, that you are having single photons here at the output. And we can even probe the single photons that are filtered in this way uh, using Hongu Mandel interference experiment, uh, where we basically collide them from the opposite inputs of the beam splitter. And if they're really distinguishable bosonic states, that they would uh, exhibit bosonic interference, meaning that they would proceed to the same output port of the beam splitter. So we would again not see clicks and clicks of the two beam splitters, of the two uh, counters. And uh, from the data in our Hongu Mandel experiment, we extract indistinguishability of around 96% for the detuned filtered blocking. So that's all very nice, and you know you can actually do probably much better than this. But uh, the question is, what it is that this picture of blockade and tunneling that I gave you complete, right? Um, it turns out that it is not complete, and the system is in our case more complicated than what we originally used to explain the toxicity. If you drive the first rung of the ladder, right? remember that we're working in a solid state system, uh, there is a photon assisted transfer to the second excited, uh, lowest excited state in the first rung. Right? So you drive this upper polariton, uh, then you would actually have emission at the same frequency. That's what we use in that simple blockade picture. But you also have photon assisted relaxation to the lower branch, which we call lower polariton, you would have emission at that frequency. Right? You always emit one photon, right? But the photon can be at two different frequencies. It could be at the frequency of the upper polariton or lower polariton. Meaning that at the output, you don't really have a POC state. You have one photon, but it could be at one of the frequencies of the two branches. So we started digging this a little bit deeper. Uh, and uh, after we performed these initial experiments, right, you see here, you will drive upper polariton, you have emission at that frequency. Uh, this is time resolved measurement. You also have time delay emission at the lower polariton frequency. And this delay corresponds to the photon assisted relaxation, right? So you really have photons at two different frequencies that can be emitted because of the photon assisted coupling. And in fact, you can even extract uh, lifetimes and you can extract phonon relaxation rate uh, and also phonon absorption rate where you couple from the bottom branch to the upper branch. So having all of this in mind, we went back to our detuned photon blockade experiments and we wanted to see how much of, of each of these uh, uh, emission from different branches we have and we wanted to really filter the states. Yeah. Um, but the the, the mechanism that uh, makes the blockade worse, but uh, well, why does it affect the blockade yeah, because the tunneling, uh, the tunneling, what we call tunneling, is not really what you have at the output. Is not really two photon state, right? We're not, we're not really driving the second run exactly. But what is happening? We see the strongest tunneling effect when we're driving in between the runs, right? And the empty cavity frequency. So what is happening is that you're driving all the runs at the same time, right? And you are. Uh, you are not really seeing only the emission of two photons plus a lot of vacuum. You're actually seeing some combination of higher order pop states and vacuum. It's, it's just, okay, so higher order. Yes, so, so okay. yes, exactly. And you're driving in between the resonances, so you're really detuned from, from the, the, the uh, rolling. Yeah. So let's now actually revisit the photon blockade in by having this photon assisted coupling in mind, right? So we still uh, perform it in the detuned regime. We drive the upper polariton um, that misses higher branches. But now we know that we can have emission from that same uh, polariton, upper polariton, in the blue, blue uh, arrow frequency, or photon assisted transition and emission in the red arrow frequency from the lower polariton. So if we don't filter anything in this detuned blockade regime, this is how our old experiments look like. In this particular case, so 0.26. Right? So this is between blockade. We know that we're emitting one photon and there is vacuum, so it's anti-bunched. But then when we start filtering at particular frequencies, let's say we filter at the blue arrow frequency, we have G2 of 0 0.162. Right? Or if we filter at the red arrow frequency, we have G2 of 0 of uh, around 6%. Or we can do cross-correlation between the two branches. 
And we we'll see that uh, in cross-correlation, of course, g to 0 is 0 0.079, which means that you are basically emitting these photons primarily from one branch or the other. Right? Um, these processes uh, don't happen at the same time. Then you can repeat the same thing when you drive the second run. Right? So then it may become even more interesting. So what happens when you drive the second run? This is what we call generating photon bundles, uh, because it's not really a Fock state with two photons anymore because of all these complex, complex relaxations that we have in the ladder. But this is a picture, right? You take the green arrow, you use the tuned system, you drive the second rung. You can have a relaxation uh, from that second rung to the first rung, upper polaritum, and then from there at the blue arrow frequency. So you can have a process where you emit a photon at the red and blue frequency. Or you can have a process where you emit photon at the red frequency and then photon assisted relaxation and then you also have a this photon at the red frequency. Right? So these are two processes that we are outlining here. So let's see what happens. Right? We drive the second run, we collect photons, and then perform uh, statistics measurements, and we see G2 0 of point, on 1.174. Right? So it's super Poissonian. And then we start dissecting this. We filter at the frequency of the blue arrow, and then we see sub Poissonian statistics. And that basically makes sense because if you look at that cascade process, you are emitting two photons at the different frequencies, right? So you are only having one photon in the cascade at the blue frequency. Then if you filter at the red frequency, you are basically filtering on this process here that is photon assisted, and these two photons are at the same frequency for the relaxation. So in that case, you have super Poissonian statistics, and you have 1.49 of G2 0. And, uh, Basically, we also can, can extract the values of G3 of 0 for that process. Uh, G2 of 0 is 1.5 um, theory in simulation, and that's what we also measured. G3 of 0, which we haven't measured yet, uh, in simulation should be 0.8, which indicates that in this case, you primarily have two photons, right? since G3 is smaller than G2. But you know they're not exactly the same states, uh, so I wouldn't really call it Fox state 2. It's a bundle consisting of two photons. Okay, so that's where we are with quantum dot cavity QED uh, at the moment. And I'd like now to pause and say, well, where is this going next? And we're interested in two main directions. One is using this system to scale it up to multiple emitters coupled to a cavity, right? So you have n emitters that are simultaneously coupled to the cavity mode. They're resonant with each other or almost resonant. And in that case, you can scale up the coupling strength in proportion with the square root of the number of emitters. So you have multi-emitter cavity QED regime where n is some, some finite number of 3, 4, 5. Right? And in that case, you still have this dress states ladder, but it's very different from the ladder that I showed you before. I mean, there are more levels and they, are different, they have different unharmonicities, so that's potentially interesting for photons. Generation of quantum states of light. Uh, we're also interested in scaling this up to systems of multiple emitters and multiple cavities. I mean, this is what, what also uh, many other people are doing uh, with atoms, for instance, and, and uh, cavity arrays of Lisha, for instance. And here, you can use this platform where you have interaction that is assisted by, by photons um, as a platform for quantum antibody physics simulations, and there are several proposals that go in that direction by, many, uh, by several theory groups in, in Europe. But if you look at both of these pictures, it is clear that in order to go in either of these directions, you need multiple emitters that are resonant with each other and also resonant with the cavities. Right? And if you revisit our quantum dots, I already told you that they have very narrow limits at around 900 nanometers. But from the AFM images, you know that they're randomly positioned on the sample. That's because you use self-assembly for, for their synthesis. And you can already see from this magnified image that they have differences in shapes and sizes, and that means that all these quantum optics basically have different properties, which changes the transition frequencies for individual quantum dots. And that leads to large homogeneous broadness. So I showed you a single quantum dot spectrum that looks very nice and narrow, but then when you look at the spectrum of an ensemble quantum dots, this is how it looks like, right? So you have very nice, narrow uh, um, artificial atoms, but they're all over the place. They're not the same. Uh, and, and that broadening is typically around 40 nanometers. 
So that would tell you that this is very hard to use for scaling the system up in the directions that I, that I mentioned before. And also this random positioning is very hard, right? Makes it hard because you have to basically carve cavities around quantum dots, or if you carve them in a regular array, then only some fraction of them would have quantum dots inside. So site and size control are basically key to scalability. So how do we go there? Well, with quantum dots, that's pretty hard. There is a lot of effort uh, by various groups around the world on, on making uh, site control quantum dots. We've collaborated with some of them. This is with uh, Ziller and Delft and Runner and Waterloo on these quantum dots in nanowire, which are technically site controlled. Quantum, each nanowire, a new phosphate nanowire, has only one new non phosphate quantum dot, but they don't really have very good properties. They are not really comparable yet to new marks and gallium marks and quantum dots. Uh, we're also collaborating with Hoffling, Sven Hoffling in Würzburg. They're able to grow indium arsenide, gallium arsenide quantum dots on a regular array uh, using some, some um, methods of inducing straining at a particular point. And this is a total scan map of quantum dots on a regular array. And recently, we've been able to do all optical uh, pumping and coherent control of an electron spin inside such quantum dot. So here you see Ramsey experiments and optical pumping of an electron spin. What is encouraging is that the results are comparable to the results that we have itself assembled randomly distributed quantum dots. But these quantum dots still have a homogeneous broadening, right? So you address the site control, but you don't really address the homogeneous broadening. So now the question is, what other emitter system can you use to address both site control and homogeneous broadening? And we recently started looking into color centers. Uh, you heard a very nice talk from Surgeon at the beginning on silicon vacancies in diamond. We're also looking into the same material system, but we're using a little bit different growth method, and this is a collaboration with Zia Shen and Nick Melosh and Steve Chu at Stanford. Uh, they basically grow uh, diamond, uh, starting with diamond, molecular diamond seeds, or diamondoids. So they use these diamondoids to functionalize the surface, and then grow diamond on top of that, and they can dope that diamond with silicon or some other um, impurities that they would like to use as color centers. And they can actually grow this on a variety of substrates. They can grow it home like a on a diamond substrate where you will sort of end up with a top, what we call delta dope layer, grown, uh, doped with silicon vacancies, with the thickness that you can control during the, the growth process. Um, and subsequently, you can also carve the structures in that material. So you end up with these pillars that only have the tip that is doped with silicon vacancies. Um, and later, I'll show you some of the beautiful structures that are made by, by uh, Marcus Wood, Mike work in the same material, so you can also carve the resonators. Um, here, if you look at the emission from an ensemble of silicon vacancy in such a nano pillar at room temperature, it looks decent, it looks pretty good. This is many silicon vacancies inside of one pillar that has been down to around 150 nanometers. And on a side, we also started looking into silicon vacancies in, in uh, silicon carbide. This is 4H silicon carbide in collaboration with uh, your Rathrop in Stuttgart. I mean, they've been doing this for a long time. Uh, typically, they use solid immersion lenses to increase collection efficiency. We started fabricating for them these nanopillars to increase collection efficiency. And here you see emission from, from these silicon vacancies that is enhanced by about three times uh, as a result of this nanopillar. So it can beat solid immersion lens, but it's easier to, to work with because it's just a nanofabricating structure. And as I mentioned before, and of course, as you could already infer from, from Surgeon's talk before mine, uh, there is a a uh, really large and great uh, effort of color centers here at Harvard uh, by the initial looking Marco Launcher, um, also the Hong Kong Park, and Ellen Hu, Amelia Kobe, Ron Besserwald, um, and a lot of other groups around the world. Okay, so I'd, uh, I'd like to spend a little bit more time explaining our progress and current efforts on silicon vacancies in Diamond, because this is also where we're starting collaboration with Harvard. And I'll also show you some of the unpublished results, um, so um, just to generate discussion and to, to show you where we stand at the moment, right? So we're, we started by publicating these nanopillar arrays in Diamond, and typically in nanopillars we have diameters going from 100 to 200 nanometers, on a regular matrix, and remember that only the tip of the pillar would be doped with silicon vacancies. So if you do a compocal scan, you would see that only the pillars would light up. Uh, and uh, if you actually perform measurement at low temperature, 
For an ensemble of silicon vacancies inside of one pillar, you see that uh, spectra overlap. So now it's not a spectrum of a single silicon vacancy, as you could uh, also see in Srujan's uh, uh, talk. This is a spectrum of an ensemble of silicon vacancies, and it exhibits these four lines that are a feature, feature of a silicon vacancy. Uh, and not only that, initially we saw that two pillars, uh, B and C, at different positions of the sample, also exhibit the same spectrum. Right? And this was actually very exciting, because we didn't do really anything special here to reduce homogeneous broadening mean We didn't really prepare the sample for growth. We didn't really clean it specially or pre etched it. We just grew this silicon uh, doped diamond layer, and it worked very well for, for such a dirty sample. Right? So we then decided to, to uh, go from there and do more analysis. Then initially, we started making different pillars. Uh, we studied the homogeneous broadening that we had in the system uh, in a, a little bit more detail. And we do see some homogeneous broadening in the smallest pillars uh, on the order of about 20 gigahertz. Right? So when we look at the silicon vacancy lines relative to the bulk silicon vacancy lines, they can differ by about 20 gigahertz. And as Rujan said, the only way to tune them is strain. Right? So the question is, where does the strain come here, uh, come from? Because we have only diamond on diamond. And most likely, it comes from the fact that that interface is not really prepared for the growth of the top layers. And then when we fabricate these pillars, we probably also amplify those effects by, by some, some impurities at the, at the surfaces. Uh, we uh, recently um, also used uh, individual silicon vacancy in such a nanopillar to perform coherent control of an excited state. So this is not really coherent control of a spin state. It's just coherent control of an excited state, where basically you use resonant pulses tuned to the upper transition. Uh, and then you detect from this green transition, right? So if this state is shortly, it's not very long lived, but you can actually coherently control it in this configuration. <laughs> and if we change the power of these resonant pulses that are driving the upper transition, we can actually see Rabi oscillation, and also we can perform Ramsey experiments if we use two pulses and tune them here. Uh, again, the state is short lived, so when you look at the decay, the two stars open your door about 200 picoseconds. But this is interesting because we can use this strain to individually resolve the levels of a single silicon vacancy and perform experiments on a single silicon vacancy here. Uh, and now, uh, also, uh, something that I'm very excited about is we recently uh, sent some of that material, initial material that we used for nanopillar experiments here to, to Marco's group. And uh, Mike Burek fabricated some of the nanobeam cavities. You've also seen some of them in, in uh, Thrujan's talk. Uh, when we perform confocal PL experiments at room temperature, we do see that they light up. So again, we here don't really use any ion implantation to position silicon um, vacancies at specific places. They're all over the place, and their densities are relatively high, but you can still individually resolve them. At room temperature, you see this broad spectrum with cavity resonances lined up on top. So cavity resonances are these narrow peaks on top. Um, and we started probing those cavity resonances and lifetimes in a little bit more detail. So here is an example of a cavity that we recently probed. You have silicon vacancy, you have cavity resonances. If you zoom in on the cavity, you see Q factor that is approaching around 5,000. It could be better. Marcus Root has demonstrated higher Qs, but on this particular trip, it ended up being around 5,000. And we also started doing time-resolved measurements. So these are just very rough time-resolved measurements where we compare lifetime in a bulk, that's a red curve, and lifetime in a, 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 lifetimes basically filtered on different cavity resonances that are on top of the silicon vacancy spectrum. And from the uh, double exponential fit uh, for the dominant decay component, in bulk we extract 1.2 nanoseconds, and here for both cavity peaks we extract 500 picoseconds and counts are pretty high, so we don't really uh, believe that this is coming from non rated decay. Um, I do think that this system now operates in the regime where cavity resonance is narrower than the silicon vacancy spectrum, so you don't really benefit from Q. Your enhancement just depends on 1 over B. Uh, and since small volumes for the two cavity resonances are similar, then you sort of expect to have a lifetime which, which is comparable for, the, for filtering of both peaks. We also done experiments at low temperature. So here, again, you start from the broad spectrum, you cool it down, uh, and when you cool it down to low temperature, you start seeing these individual lines corresponding to 
uh, straight split silicon vacancies, and some of them are coupled to the cavity resonance. And then we also started uh, doing time result measurements on uncoupled versus coupled ones. Uh, and this is what we see, right? So at low temperature, decay in bulk, or for the uncoupled ones, is around 1.7 nanoseconds. And then for the coupled ones, the dominant decay component for this particular structure was 1.1 nanoseconds, right? Uh, and there is also this other uh, lower, uh, other additional component in the double exponential decay of 0.3 to 0.4 nanoseconds, but which has a much smaller coefficient in the experiment. Again, this is a rough data. We didn't really do any theory or anything. But I think from everything that we see, from the counts and from the decay uh, and from the enhancement, I believe that we're starting to see some, some spontaneous emission rate enhancement. And there are many more cavities to probe. And, and uh, uh, it's quite exciting to go in that direction. Right? So the other thing that we're looking into in order to couple silicon uh, vacancies in diamond to resonators is this hybrid system. Right? Uh, we know how to make resonators in silicon carbide and in many other materials. And in this case, we use 3C silicon carbide and we make microdisc resonators. And then we put it inside of this plasma chamber that is used for growth of diamond. And because plasma density is uh, stronger around the edges of the microdisc, uh, after we functionalize it with we, we diamondoids, it turns out that these nanodiamonds synthesize primarily around the edges of microdisc. So depending on the time of the growth, you can control sort of the yield of resonators that have nanodiamonds attached to the resonators themselves, and also the size of the nanodiamond. So for the growth time of 15 minutes, the yield is 8%, which means that 8% of resonators have nanodiamonds somewhere. And nanodiamond size is around 60 to 100 nanometers. And then if you increase the growth time to 30 minutes, yield increases to about 12%. But then also nanodiamond size is bigger. It's around 120 to 180 nanometers. But what is interesting here is that, well, two things are interesting. Uh, first, they attach towards the edges of the microdisc, and that's because of the plasma density. And that's exactly the region where these dispersive gallery modes have the strongest field intensity. And second, if you look at these nanoparticles, they really look like little diamonds. They have very nice facets. They don't really look like crunched diamond with rough surfaces. They have very nice polished surfaces. And uh, Steve Chu, who is also part of this collaboration, is interested in using these systems of its smaller dimensions for biological imaging. But he's interested in the regime where they have dimensions smaller than 10 nanometers. So we're not there yet. We do see silicon vacancy in 60 nanometer diameter diamonds. But when we make them smaller, we don't really see silicon vacancies uh, inside of the smaller diameter particles. It could just be something that could be adjusted by the process, but it could also be something else happening which kills the emission from, from the center there. Um, we can also couple them to the cavity resonances at uh, room temperature. Um, you see the broad silicon vacancy spectrum, and you see cavity uh, peak, this spray gallery mode peak uh, there. Um, you can also. In this case, we also saw some chromium emission, which came from dirt in the chamber. And we did see chromium uh, vacant, chromium center actually coupled to some of the whisper gallery mode resonances. We didn't really see in time result measurement anything interesting here um, at room temperature, but we're still working on that. So maybe we'll be able to report something interesting pretty soon. And then at low temperature, we could also see individual lines for both uh, silicon vacancy and for chromium. Uh, coupled uh, to uh, these spray gallery mode resonances, right? And we are yet to probe uh, in time result measurements the lifetime of these individual lines. So this would be potentially another approach to building a uh, cavity QED platform using color centers. Uh, in this particular case, we don't really expect to see very uh, exciting results as with Marcos nanobeams, and this is because these micro disks, although they have a diameter of only two microns, they still have much bigger mode volume than nanobeam resonators. So nanobeam resonator would have a mode volume of about cubic optical wavelength, and here we have several cubic optical wavelength of, of the mode volume. And also your silicon vacancy is only coupled to the evanescent tail of the whispery gallery mode inside of the disk. Okay. So now uh, I'd like to transition, uh, uh, spend the last 10 minutes or so telling you about a very different part of the work that we're doing. Um, and before I transition there, I'd like to pause and show all the structures uh, that my group has been working on for many years, and which are very similar to other non structures that other groups are doing. 
but if you look at all of these shapes, they're very regular. Uh, they look like nice circles and, and disks and periodic structures. And this is how nanoplastics has been looking for many years, pretty much, right? Um, but the question that we asked a few years back was, could we design and make better nanoplastic devices? And by that, we mean, could we achieve better device performance, uh, better structure performance? Could we achieve small footprints? Uh, could we achieve robustness to fabrication imperfections or various temperature variations, um, add functionalities, and could we even design these structures so that we eliminate expertise that is currently necessary in order to design any optical device, right? And someone would have to start from the library of the known devices, tune a few parameters, and that's how they design the new devices. Uh, so we, a few years back, came up with the algorithm uh, that we call the inverse design algorithm or objective first algorithm, uh, which basically says that you can do all of this. And we just touched the tip of an iceberg, and there is a lot of exciting work going on uh, around the world at the moment uh, by various groups, including uh, Marco and uh, Alejandro Rodriguez, on optimization. But the structures that we ended up with in the process look something like this, and they look very different from the nanophotonic structures that you've seen before. But not only that they look different, they outperform known structures. They are more compact, more efficient, and very counterintuitive. So again, a lot of work going in related areas, uh, or either complex optimization or uh, other optimization approaches. And I list some of the groups here. Uh, I met uh, some, some people working uh, between Marcos and Alejandro Rodriguez's group on uh, steepest descent optimization uh, this, uh, uh, today at lunch. Uh, we do that, but we also use objective first approach that I'll mention later, which is sort of the new thing that our group is doing. So what is uh, the idea here? Well, let's say you would like to design a valence splitter, right? And valence splitter would be the structure that uh, basically splits uh, two valence that you have in the input the wave guide into two output ports efficiently. And you would like to use a very constrained footprint, in this particular case, 2.8 by 2.8 microns. Uh, you will say, well, let's try to probe the whole parameter space and design something that works better than any known valence splitter today, right? So how would you do that? Well, brute force approach would be, let's say, pixelate the region in 100 nanometer pixels and try to fill up or empty each pixel here, right? And that, in principle, would work, right? But if you look at the number of combinations that you have here by including or excluding pixel, you have 2 to the power of 784 possibilities, which is a 237-digit number. So unless you are extremely lucky, you'll never probe the full parameter space. Right? So that won't work. Hmm? Oh, maybe you can build a quantum computer. Yeah, you can probe. That's, a, that's actually a good uh, application yeah, for quantum theories. Yeah. So full parameter space is enormous, and that's not what we want to do. Um, can tuning won't work. So we concluded that full parameter space design must be designed by specification. Right? So what is designed by specification? Right? So you go back to that valence splitter, and you say, I want to have these input modes, these output modes. I'm constraining the design region. And then inside of this region, I basically apply some optimization uh, techniques to physics. So I have physics-guided optimization. Right? It's not brute force, it's physics-guided optimization. Meaning that you travel down some route, steepest descent route in parameter space, and you can also use some tricks, which is what we call objective first, to sort of initially localize yourself in some part of the parameter space where you should be looking for a solution. You never know that you found a global optimum, but you stop at the local optimum once your solution is good enough according to your specifications. And here is how our trick to parameter space looks like for valence splitting. You start from the uniform block of silicon, 2.8 by 2.8 microns. You go through the first phase, uh, this objective first puts you somewhere in parameter space. You continuously optimize the electric constant. You end up with continuous uh, um, distribution of the electric constant that works as valence splitter, but it's not something that you can make. Then we do this boundary parameterization, meaning that you discretize the electric constant to something that you can make. And then you can also go implement broadband design. We wanted to make a broadband valence splitter that has 100 nanometer bandwidth. And this looks different than this structure here, although it looks very similar because this is feeding into the broadband optimization. And this is, if you don't do 
any uh, broadband uh, optimization, then you end up basically with the splitters that have very narrow bandwidth around the center wavelength. So it's you know something like few nanometers. Uh, but then if you do broadband design, we extend it to 100 nanometers. 100 nanometers. I can show you pictures. And the loss is the same. The loss is your optimization parameter, right? So you stop when you're happy with the loss. In this case, we constrain loss to about, I mean, transmission to 80 percent. But you can search longer and end up with something that's more efficient. And here is the uh, resulting structure. As I said, it's broadband. It, has, it splits 100 nanometer wide band around 1.3 microns to one port. The other 100 nanometer band into the other port. And you can see here how it looks, right? 1.3, 1.5 microns. This is the design that you have to fabricate action silicon or insulator. And also, you can see the movie as you scan the wavelength at the input. It first goes to the top port and eventually splits and goes to the bottom port, right? So this is a very efficient valence splitter, greater than 80% transmission to the output ports, and it's very compact, right? So the only more compact splitter is plasmonic valence splitter, but it's not efficient. So this is the smallest efficient valence splitter, right? Um, I mentioned that we have a unique thing that we call objective first. So objective first basically localizes us in some region of parameter space where we should look, search for solution. And I will not go into details of that, but if we apply that objective first and then Adjoint optimization, which is basically steepest descent, you follow gradient, and that's how you travel through parameter space. We can now achieve these efficiencies that are greater than 80%. If you just apply adjoint optimization to this problem, we obtain lower efficiencies. Right? So it, uh, it helps in, in uh, many, many problems. This also works as valence splitter, but just not as well as the one that we designed here. Uh, we can also closely pack them, right? So if you put them next to each other, 300 nanometer, 312, uh, 3.12 nanometer, um, sorry, 3.12 micron pitch, uh, and they are 2.8 microns in size, you can see the transmission for individual splitters inside of this array is the same as transmission for splitters without the array, right? So you can closely pack them. And also, if you design them to be broadband, then they're automatically robust to temperature variations and fabrication imperfections. So even if you change temperature by many degrees, the structure still operates as the wavelength splitter at the target wavelength of 1.3 or 1.5 microns. If you use ring resonator coupled to wavelength and change temperature by few degrees, it's totally off the resonance, right? That's why they have to do wavelength uh, temperature stabilization for modulators. But here, if you design it to be broadband, even if you change, change temperature by 100 degrees, it's still a wavelength splitter. Uh, and you can also tolerate fabrication imperfections. If you make everything smaller by 8 nanometers or bigger by 8 nanometers, it's still a wavelength splitter. Right? It degrades performance by a little bit, but it still works well. Right? So that robustness is really good because finally, you, know, you can go even to university fabrication lab and make structures that work the same. It's not that every structure has, has uh, uh, different performance on the chip. So we take the pattern that the computer designs, we load it, uh, we've designed this structure uh, on the graphics cards and design time for three-dimensional devices is between four and, and 20 hours, depending on the problem. Uh, you load it, you fabricate it in silicon, these are fabricated structures. Um, again, fabricated structures coupled to waveguides. This blob here is a wavelength splitter. These are just thin waveguides and input and output to couple to fibers. This theory that I showed you before, and this is an experiment where we measured performance for three devices and plotted on top of each other. So these are not error bars. And they all basically perform the same, right? And uh, I was very excited to see this because when you actually start from photonic crystals, that's not what you typically see because they are sensitive to a lot of fabrication imperfections. But, uh, when I saw this and I went to my colleague who works in optimization, Stephen Boyd, and I told him, we measured them and they all look the same. And then he, and he said, well, that's robust design. <laughs> They're supposed to all look the same. They're not supposed to be different. Uh, we've designed many other structures. I really won't go through the list. They sort of look the same, like Swiss cheese, but they have very different performance. Uh, you have a mold converter, which is super compact, uh, less than 2 microns and greater than 90% efficiency. Normally, you do adiabatic mold conversion over hundreds of microliters, right? But here, you can do it in a very compact space. Uh, here, we do mold splitters. We can do hubs. Uh, also structures that operate differently at two different valence. This one actually at 1.5 has one performance and 1.3 crosses inputs and outputs over different performance. You can even design new functionalities that you, you haven't seen before. 
And we're slowly actually now uh, making these structures one by one. Uh, recently, we designed and, and made three-way power splitter. Uh, here, we also incorporate, set up some values that we know that we can easily fabricate in our facility. So we set up minimum radius of cur uh, curvature to 40 nanometers, minimum mm, gap and bridge width to 90 nanometers. And this is the three-way power splitter that we call its split inputs to three alpha ports. Uh, theoretical performance and also experimental performance. Uh, and another thing that we recently designed and are measuring at the moment is this three-way wavelength splitter, which is the same as this two-way wavelength splitter I showed you before. But now we do a so-called constrained design, right? So instead of probing the full parameter space, we just say, well, let's design these potatoes on a regular grid, right? So we can just move surfaces, and we right away dis design discrete dielectric constant distribution. And this looks like bad photonic crystal, but it's not a photonic crystal at all, right? We just design them to that have these specific shapes. And the structure works as a three-way wavelength splitter, uh, which splits three wavelengths that are relatively close, in fact. They are closer than the ones we did before. They are 40 nanometers apart. So that's kind of interesting. And finally, to kind of unite the first and second part of my talk, we're also designing cavities for cavity QED. Uh, we want to design cavities with um, high uh, Q factor and small mode volume so that we can increase the strength of the interaction with quantum emitters. And uh, we're already getting somewhere. We're designing some cavities that are having very known, well, they look like cavities, right? They have some mirrors, but they don't really look like cavities that we used before. Uh, at the moment, we have Qs of about 4,000 low volumes of 0.64 cubic wavelength. Uh, Q is not as impressive yet because it's constrained by the size of the region that we can optimize, right? Because we're only designing a total Q. And this is the size of the region that we could optimize there. If we could basically take and design bigger region, Q would be bigger. But at the moment, we're solving the problem, what's the highest Q to be cavity that you could fit inside of this Q micro region, uh, design region. And we're already uh, implementing some mirror symmetries and increasing this, so hopefully uh, next time I see you, I'll be able to report some, some much uh, more exciting values. Is this uh, completely empty space when you start, or do you start? We start either uh, with completely uh, with a slab of material, right? And then you are uh, same as for the other problems. So yes. Typically slab of high-index material, but sometimes we start with something between high-index and air, right? And that gives you two different solutions, but, you know, that's a well, different story, which we'll discuss later. But, you know, it gives you a local solution that works. So, uh, present nanophotonics looks something like this, but in the future, you know, may look something like this, right? Very different. And uh, we're very excited to, to probe on this unexplored uh, parameter space of, of nanophotonic and quantum photonic devices. Uh, so finally, to acknowledge people who did the work, uh, this is my current group, um, Inverse Design Team, Alex Pigot, Jan Petikiewicz, Logan Su, uh, Yusuf Kalaita, Neil Sapra, Heavy QED, uh, then uh, Quantum Dot Team, Konstantinos Logodakis, Tomas Sarmiento, Konstantin Dori, Peter McMahon, who is affiliated with my group, his former student of Yoshi Yamamoto, and Kevin Fisher, and then uh, Power Center's team, Linda Jan, Marina Rodulashki, and Jacob Heinz. And also recent alumni, uh, Kai Muller, who is back in Germany, Tom Babinick, Michal Baichi, Arnold Rackquist, Jesse Lu, Sonia Buckley, and Arka Majinda. And thank you very much for your attention. Rates are lower, but you are getting higher quality performance. Yeah. So, 
So, like, I mean, the, even though you are getting the lower G2, yeah. uh, that's because uh, it's, because, uh, like, G2 doesn't reflect the zero point phase actually. Because it's conditional. That's, that's uh, true. And the reason uh, why you have super Poissonian statistics when you have uh, four states with larger photon number is because you have a lot of vacuum, right? Yeah. So, so if you have. Uh, Fox state with two photons, then G2 of zero should be one half, right? Yeah. But it's not one half. We do see super Poisson in statistics, and that's because you have mostly vacuum, right? Then it basically goes as one over two times mean photon number. Uh, so that's that's uh, correct that you have a lot of vacuum, but you are producing when you produce the photon state, you actually have uh, indistinguishable single photons, or you you can actually filter out. Uh, potentially using the processes that I showed later, other clock sets. Right? So if you are considering the first operation, actually, the, the large percentage of your I mean, agitation yeah. will be just like coupling. It's not coupling, yeah. yes, that's true. But you know our system is so fast that we cannot really do uh, continuous wave measurements. Um, I mentioned that our rates are on the order of tens of gigahertz, right? Um, so we cannot really do continuous wave uh, statistics measurements because uh, resolution of your counters is around 300 picoseconds, and decay of our processes is few tens of picoseconds. Okay. Yeah, so in atomic physics, of course, you can, and people have done also asymmetry in statistics when they're probing random group different uh, runs, but you cannot really do that. You can only do fast measurements, unless you come up with detectors that have few picosecond resolution. Do you know the in describing these uh, wave length splitters, you uh -huh. say this is a three-dimensional optimization. Yeah. Uh, so it looks to me like only two spatial dimensions matter. So I was wondering, well, are these three spatial dimensions? Or? Yeah, it's three spatial dimensions, but we are constrained vertically to slabs, uh, silicon insulator slabs for these problems. And because that's, or, or slabs of semiconductors sitting on lower index material, because this is what we can fabricate. But we've done optimizations where we also fully control third dimension, and you end up with some complex structure that varies in all three dimensions, but that's not something that we can make unless you do some interference techniques or, or yeah, we talked over lunch about nanoscribe. I think, Mark, you were thinking about it. Uh, that something like that potentially could be used, but resolution is not, not that great. So you would have to run constrained optimization on higher, larger feature sizes. Yeah, but for what we typically fabricate is these two-dimensional structures that have vertical confinement, and that's why we constrain vertical dimension to something that, you know, Baker that you already have. But you have to run three-dimensional optimization because two-dimensional optimization would not give you the right picture. You're not capturing loss, right, which is mostly in the third dimension. Um, so at least for me, it's a little harder to, to like have an intuition for why holes in this pattern would give you this path. Like, um, but at least the specific question I have is: is what do the other S parameters look like for this device? You, I think you showed only like S12 and S13. Yes, yes. I mean, we uh, you're talking about uh, uh, transmission, unwanted transmission to the other ports and reflections, uh, and yeah. I mean, I, I can't tell you exactly on, on top of my head, but they are quoted all in the paper, right? Uh, we do use unwanted transmission, let's say your mode, uh, 1.3 micron mode, unwanted transmission to the wrong waveguide, right? So that's one of the design parameters, and that's typically constrained to below 1%, right? And then uh, loss, um, I mean transmission, wanted transmission during optimization should be uh, greater than 80%, so you, you can say, well, where is the rest? Um, typically you have some, mostly in these devices it's scattering loss and reflection back into the input right? But you can control that during the design process, right? It's just a question where you want to stop. Don't think that this is the global optimum, right? We say, okay, we're happy with 80%, that's better than what we had before. But you can also say, well, I want 99%, and then you have to search through space longer. Yes, I'm a little bit confused about this phone line uh, transition between mm -hmm. the two polar times. Do you have a good understanding of what both the microscopic mechanism is? Uh, I think it's just a basically multi-photon process that you have. Uh, I mean, that is just coupling these branches, um, basically dephasing them in some way, and then uh, I mean, because they still 
Um, I mean, it's, I wouldn't say it's any different from other polynomial assisted processes that are also happening uh, levels in silicon vacancies. You just have polynomials in this, re at this range of frequencies inside of the quantum dot, and they're working on coupling different branches of the lab. So, for example, like, do you have a good yeah, understanding of how this like how the cross section this process scales. People have done a lot of theoretical studies of quantum processes in affecting uh, uh, quantum dot states, right? And also there was some work on on uh, effect on quantum processes on uh, quantum dots in cavities by Stephen Hughes from Canada, and there are a lot of theoretical um, and modeling papers on that. Um, People haven't really looked at it uh, in so, such a great detail here, but we are running quantum optics simulations uh, of this using those models, and they do seem to agree with what, what we're seeing. So that's um, you know how far I, I can go, but it's just uh, basically some form of density of states. I think I kind of flipped to that slide so they can see what we're talking about. It's some form of density of states in the system, and then um, I mean, from the measurements, you can extract uh, the decay rates of the polaritons, and uh, you can even extract the, the polynomial rates, um, and you can actually absorb or emit photons um, at this frequency. Of course, the emission is um, more likely than absorption, but that basically limits the lifetime of the polariton branches because if you didn't have that, it should be much larger. Right? And since we have these processes, lifetime goes as one of our lifetime of this process plus one of their radiative lifetime which comes from just decay, cavity decay, and, and uh, dipole decay. And this is the limiting mechanism in this particular case. But it's not nothing else than just multiple emission that couples branches here. Yeah. And I can give you full models, for information on the models that you have developed. How do you get it? Uh, I it goes uh, in a few tens of years.